Welcome to Last Call. Last Call is devotionals that we are recording, posting, writing, recording, posting, writing, uh, and developing, I guess you could say, for the internet, specifically for the reason to address certain issues that maybe aren't being done currently. I know that for myself, having books in my hand was one of the most important things that I could imagine, and yet, as a born-again Christian at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, I couldn't get to books I needed for studying the scriptures. I, at one time, went to the only time that they combined the high school ministry with the college and career to go up to a retreat at the conference center, and while I went up there, it was the only time that I got a chance to access a library that I could stay inside for those three days that we were there, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And while we were attending meetings that were going on in the morning, devotionals and Bible studies with pastors visiting, you know, and doing their thing, I finally had a chance to get a hold of the Strong's Concordance for the first time because I was too poor to be able to afford a Strong's Concordance. Eventually, I got a cheap $8.95 one that was um, from Christian Books Distributors or something. It was really cheap, and it was even marked down, if I remember right. But I could never afford that study tools that would help me to know the scriptures. Because, bluntly, my mind, I have a high IQ, so my intelligence quotient was pretty high, and I could think of things that normally... If it wasn't for Jesus intervening in my life directly, I would already be a non-believer because I could argue what theologians seem to think they know, but they never really approached it from a Jewish perspective, I don't think, or they never really examined some of the predicated premise that they have. So unless you take from what God has said to be true, which one of them is that you must have the Holy Spirit inside you to interpret the Bible, then if you're just trying to argue scriptures from an apologetic point of view or a theological summation, you're going to fail miserably when you run into someone that's intelligent or someone who has logic for a base, because it's not that hard to disprove most things in the Bible. It's not that hard to disprove even the scriptures themselves. I mean, to put it bluntly. Now, accurately so, I can say that I can prove everything because God gives me the wisdom to be able to know where the answer is for what people are using or abusing in their knowledge base of who God is and what God is. So a lot of what I lived on or how I got by as a born-again Christian to start with before I attended Calvary Daily and went to Bible study, I had to go to live Bible studies every day of the week because I couldn't even afford to get tapes or couldn't afford to buy the Christian books, you know, or Follow my, you know, whatever it was at those days that we used to have to do, you know, whether it be to get the tape or, you know, buy the t-shirt or whatever it may be. Now, I would never have bought a t-shirt because Keith Green was around at that time, and he used to say that, you know, counterculture was, you know, if you were really a Christian, you didn't buy bumper stickers, you know, you didn't send money, you didn't do all these things, you know, that today we do normal. You know, get the shirt, get the t-shirt, get the Christian paraphernalia. You know, I was taught a little different, but that's okay. If you got one, hey, praise the Lord. I mean, my little shirt has, a, I think, a little H on it or something. Now, I would love to tell you that I collect these or that somehow I'm a, I'm an idol maker, that, you know, I have to have a name brand. But really, no, I bought it at a used store. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if you find me with a name brand of anything, I got it from a used store. Not because it was a name brand, but because it was cheap. And if it was cheap and it works, I bought it. That's the way I think. And that's what it is with having Last Call devotionals. We wanted to do this introduction. I was going to teach on, you know, trust in the Lord with all the heart, but maybe we might skip that a little bit because Last Call is really your last call to get your act together. I mean, you're going to hell, to put it bluntly, and there's a lot of people that are helping you to get there. You see, Jesus made some interesting statements that are very clear and very direct that are poignant, if we could say, Point it in the way that they hurt when you hear them. 
Jesus didn't just give, you know, these nice messages that was like, oh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of God. And that's it. But rather he added some things throughout that message that he said, these are my sayings, you must do them or else. And what did he mean by else? He uses the sheep and the goats parable not to talk only about nations, but to talk about people in those nations. People that were acting like sheep. People that were acting like goats. People that were willing to eat anything. Basically, like goats. But I would like to change the goats to dogs. Because Jesus used the word dogs when he was talking to the Gentile woman. And that's kind of a slam where people don't realize that, hey, he wasn't kidding in what he said. That, you know, the dogs, you know, bite at the scraps, you know, that are tossed to the table. You know, and she was saying she knew what she was. She knew she wasn't chosen. And that's the way it is with people that aren't saved. If your attitude isn't one of like, hey, they're really dogs and you expect them to act like dogs, be like dogs, and be just like what you see on the internet, dressing up dogs like people, dressing up cats like people, I got news for you. A non-Christian is a dog and a cat, and a lot of Christians act like that. It's true. In Last Call, we want to be blunt. We want to be truthful. We want to be honest with you. I mean, I can tell you till you're blue in the face about how guns are not part of God and His grace. Grace was given to you to give grace out. And there's nothing about a gun that gives grace. I'm sorry. You can try to act like you can get away with violence by saying, well, I'm a police officer, so, you know, I, that doesn't apply to me. Quit your job. It will. I'm a soldier. It doesn't apply to me. Quit being a soldier. It will. Well, I'm this and I'm that and I'm the other thing. Well, quit doing it and you will. You see, I know the excuses that are used and I tried them before God. Unfortunately, because of my life, God chose to intervene directly in my life so that I would answer to every man and answer for their criteria of criticism that they have against God or against following Jesus. Because I was one of those that could easily make up excuses like you can about owning a gun or going to war or, you know, pretending that Afghanistan is about, you know, protecting our country or somehow that, you know, some of these other wars were all about, you know, we got to stop the terrorists. Um, how many terrorists killed how many Americans in America? Because that's the next question I have is how many Americans killed Americans in America? Because if we're talking numbers, there are more Americans killing Americans than there are terrorists killing Americans. So I don't know about you, but I don't think I have to worry about the terrorists. I think I have to worry about the Americans. And as a matter of fact, I don't think I have to worry at all, because if I can't believe that God has got the whole world in his hands, what am I doing calling myself a Christian? How am I living if I think that guns are going to help me? As a matter of fact, since gun violence is now happening more often than and more people are dying from gun violence than people driving automobiles that concerns me that threatens me that makes it such a real life incident that Christians are arguing about why they're entitled to have guns they're even saying in some of the biblical theological schools hey bring your gun man we'll show you how to use it will make you responsible. Are you really? So anyone that owns a gun, you'll be responsible for. Because that's really what it applies to. If you're a part of the guns, you're part of the gun nature. You're part of the gun cult. A part of the gun environment. You're one of those gun owners. And, you know, when you get into an argument or a fight, what do you do with your gun? Is it locked up safe so no one can get to it? Or do you go get it and take care of your problems one by one? Recently, there was a man that went and saved his son, supposedly. You know, Fox News, being such as it is, reporting these weird stories and never reporting something accurately. But, you know, a man saves his son because he goes to the hospital and he holds up the doctors and the nurses. Gunpoint. Right. That's a good way to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Or, you know, people argue about, well, what happens if, you know, the... Uh, you know, guy breaks into your house, you know, and it's going to threaten your kids. I'd say, I'm not worried about the guy that's threatening my kids. I'd be more worried about what's going to happen to me after I die if I kill that guy and I have to answer to Jesus for the blood. I mean, have you ever figured that one out that you are responsible for every single human being that you get pissed off at? 
that you get mad at, that you call stupid or fool, like I'm calling you stupid and foolish? I know I'm accountable, but do you? You see, that's why we started last call originally, was because I knew that in the devotionals, as short as they were, as simple as they were, as precise as they were, you could get God fast and get on with the right teaching. Now that I've heard Bible study pastors, including Greg Laurie and some of the major Calvary Chapel pastors, teaching some false things. Now, I'm not against Greg, because Greg, you know, I got saved at Greg's church, you know, way back when, when he was still getting started. But Greg's got some things that are off. Don Stewart's got some things that are off. Don Stewart told somebody recently to go ahead and buy a gun and own a gun and carry a gun. And I said, you know what? You need to go back to square 101 and learn from Jesus, because I know where you got your knowledge from. And it wasn't from the spirit of God, it was from the spirit of man. It's called the spirit of Antichrist that's gone out into the world. Because I can sit down and prove to you how you don't use guns today. And you don't own guns today. But if you want to go along with your idols, then yeah, hey, just be like the heathen. Because the heathen, the dogs of war have been loosed. The spirit of God who convicts us of sin doesn't convict you of owning a gun, does he? You don't feel bad the first time you made your first kill, or did you? The first time your butterfly died, or your cat died, or whatever died. People cry more about some animal that's on Facebook than they do about real life. But they're willing to pick up the knife, the gun, be violent, in order to protect what they have. And that's the problem we have today, is the condition of the heart. Man looks on the outward things and uses the outward things in order to protect himself, which is the outward things. The very fact that he can get a gun and think that he can own a gun means he's already deceived in his heart. He didn't pray about it. I don't know anyone that says, hey, I sat down and I had a long talk with Jesus and Jesus told me, go out and get a gun. Really? Because what I hear people say, especially in the South, where people from the Bible Belt, they'll say the Bible says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Of course, we know that doesn't apply, but they'll still say it. Or, well, I know that God told the children of Israel, you know, that they, you know, go kill these Amorites, Hittites, Shivites, Canaanites, you know. Kind of play with that one for a while in the Old Testament, you know, under the law, whatever you want to apply that way to go. But I often ask them, I said, well, what did Jesus say? Well, Jesus, you know, he... He cleared out the temple, but did he whip anybody? I mean, I want to know, because I think somebody would have accused him of assault and battery, but none of them did. Not one accusation came up at the trial of Jesus that, hey, he's the one who uh, beat me when, uh, you know, the riot started at the temple when he turned over the tables of the money changers. Well... Nobody said anything because there he knew the money changers weren't supposed to be in the temple. And he didn't assault anyone. He drove out the animals. Or, you know, we, we hear this story about, you know, Jesus tells him to go out and buy a sword. I always love that story because it's always fascinating me because it bugged me. You know, it bugged me for a long time. Then about 15 years ago, I think maybe 20 years ago, you know, some guy on the internet, you know, I mean, maybe it's 15 because it's the internet. About 15 years ago, a guy writes about the two swords, you know. And uh, he did a long research Bible study, you know, from not only Jewish culture, but from, you know, uh, Gentile culture. He was a Christian, you know, and he is a Bible belt background type person. I think he was a Baptist, I'm not sure. But he went very in-depth, and he showed how when Jesus told Peter to buy the sword, wasn't to go out and to carry swords, but rather was when it was before Peter takes up the sword, and slices off, literally, the priest's ear, and Jesus heals him. He says to him, what are you doing? You know, I says, he says, you know, well, Peter probably looks up and says, well, you told me to get a sword. I mean, that's what I would have done about Peter. And Peter's, Jesus says, anyone that lives by the sword will die by the sword. I'm allowing this to happen. It's meant to be. These are things that are supposed to happen. Now, think about that. Jesus is supposed to be arrested. Jesus is supposed to be convicted. And Jesus is supposed to die. Now, you tell me if someone breaks into my house how much I have to worry about it. Job. Hey, Job's all persecuted and blasted, and he's got three Christian roommates that are telling him what to do. None of them were right. God even had to come down and say, look, I'm doing what I want to do. 
I've already complimented you, but you didn't know that. I've already talked to Satan about you, you know, and you didn't know that. But hey, you know, you want to argue about it? I'm not going to tell you why. You see, that's the difference between what a man of God is and what a baby of God is. And a lot of people are running around sucking their thumbs and sticking their fingers in their ears because they don't want to hear what God has to say about guns, about violence, about today. Because, you see, it's interesting that the Word of God isn't really the Bible. It is something that's transformed from the Bible into becoming the Word of God by way of your hearing it as the Spirit of God gives you ears to hear what the Spirit of God says. You can't just take the Bible without the Spirit of God and make it into being the Word of God. It's not. First of all, a Bible means book of books, and that's what the Bible is. It's a historical book. It's a poetical book. It's got all kinds of things in it. I mean, it's all those books. It's a book of books. But it is not the Word of God until God breathes life into it, and it is made applicable to you. It doesn't apply to the same way to the same person that might be sitting next to you. In other words, there's a difference between every single person that is hearing it, and they're all getting it a little differently. There's a reason why. Because you may be one of the most jack-of-all-trades when it comes to owning every gun in the world. And when you listen to somebody teach or preach, you only hear, hey, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, man, I got that down, and you ignore the rest. But that's what the Spirit of God has kept you from hearing about love your enemies. I got news for you. You can sign on the dotted line and join the military because you're going to Armageddon. There is no doubt about it. You're being prepared. I don't know what's in your background that suddenly made you into a violent person, but all violent people are very well trained by God to go to Armageddon and decide for themselves where they want to go. I wouldn't want to be there, you know, heading down Jerusalem way. You know, I wouldn't want to be there heading for my grave because I got news for you. As far as the rapture is concerned, you might as well check it because if you got a gun on, you ain't going anywhere, baby. <laughs> you take your personal, you know, protection device. And tell me just how fast they're going to get raptured. Right. Uh-huh. I get it. I don't think you realize exactly who you're talking to when you start recognizing that you're making the decisions and you haven't prayed about it. That's why we have devotionals. Every day, last call is coming back to the way we were taught. Back to the truth. Back to the way markers of the faith that have been around since... 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, and in the Jesus movement. Now, I don't know what happened to some of my fellow pastors, you know, and ministers that learned grace, were taught grace, and went out and got in your face. I'm not quite sure where they go with that. You know, I mean, okay, I get it. I mean, you know, I get it as far as dogs are concerned. I get it as far as cats are concerned. And I get it as far as the ungodly are concerned. But if you tell me you're a man of God, I don't buy it. You may be a man of God failing. You may be a man of God carnal, but you're not a man of God. Of God means you are imbued with godliness, and you don't have to fear dying, or you don't have to protect your family. You could call down angels if you needed to, or you could tell that mountain to be removed, and you don't because you want to let God do his will. Because you're willing to say, not my will but thy will be done, and then you're willing to ask God, what is your will? Because if you're assuming you know the will of God because you read a Bible, you're wrong. I got news for you. People say this interesting concept, God won't contradict himself. God won't contradict what's in the word of God. Want to bet? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Love your enemies so they don't conflict. I mean... Once you begin to understand where God's coming from with all these and you ask him personally, he'll probably explain it to you. But, you know, he did me. I mean, it took a few years, but I wasn't really ready for it at the time that he explained it to me. But I thought about it afterwards and I began to ask intelligent questions later in life, but not right away. At first, I just went, the answer, my thoughts are not your thoughts and your will, not my will. And, you know, as high as the heaven just didn't fit it for me when I was young. I went. That's not right. How come you get to say that and I don't? I mean, you know, he is God, but who cares? I'm willing to argue with him. You know, I mean, Abraham did, so I uh, figured I could too. So I get your point, you know, about wanting to do your own thing. I get your point about wanting to be your own man. 
I get your point about what you think is freedom in America, which it isn't. I mean, you know, there are Christians that will stand. I mean, I know almost every Calvary Chapel in the world will probably stand up and tell you, hey, go vote, which that's not a Christian thing. That's a man humanism thing. And if you want to do it, you can. You're, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. I personally think voting is such a waste of time. No offense, but that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> I don't sit on the fence of saying, hey, I'm going to vote for this guy because I believe in his compromising and his lying and his telling me things that aren't going to come true and then going and doing what he thinks is right for me anyway. That's politics. Yeah, compromise, lying, doing what they think is right for you, pretending that you have a say in it. You don't have to say in it. Come on, give me a break. Be real. There's no one-to-one -one representation. So there's no democracy. There's representative republic. Uh, there's representative dem democratic self-rule, accordingly, which isn't self-rule, but it's, you know, the worst form of government that God said there could be because nobody's responsible, but everybody's acting like, you know, nobody takes the blame, but everybody passes it on. Well, the president is. No, he didn't. He's got like 20 or 30 counselors and other people that are involved. So, you know, kind of like, mm, not much on politics. But the point being is this. You are accountable for your actions. You are accountable for your thoughts. You are accountable for your words. You are accountable for buying a gun or not buying a gun. You are accountable for killing that sucker that breaks into your house or witnessing to him. So really, when you stand before Jesus and he's talking about sheep and goats, I want to know what you think you should have been doing. Because we're told what you should have been doing. And it wasn't like, you know, hey, kicking the enemy out because, oh my God, those refugees might be terrorists. like Americans aren't? I mean, you can see on the freeway road rage and you're going to tell me some people aren't terrorists in their own car? They aren't terrorists in their own home beating their wives or killing their kids? Come on. The terrorism you think is not the terrorism that is. What's going on is the Spirit of God is pulling back from the world and things are getting darker, not lighter. Christians are teaching the wrong things and focusing on the wrong message. I mean, God bless Greg Laurie. When he's on, he's on. I mean, when it comes to evangelism, man, the guy is wonderful. Teaching evangelism, promoting evangelism, being a part of evangelistic crusades. You know, I'm not big on crusades, but, you know, it's okay. You know, they do it. But, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, I imagine he's probably one dynamic man of God leading someone to Jesus. Now, they do get into the sinner's prayer thing, which is like, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, you can just easily say, God help me, and God will help you. But the point being is this. Jesus made a lot of statements that we don't teach as much anymore. And that's why we're coming back to last call of devotionals. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Now, wait a minute. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that's telling me I can know Jesus. They're telling me I can accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, and then I can go out and have a wonderful life. I mean, really, that's what the message is in the gospel. You know, God's got a plan for your life. God's got a purpose for your life. And he's going to bless you out of your mind. But you're going to go through a few struggles, you know, like it's kind of like birth pains, you know, but it's not going to be that bad. It's okay. You'll get over it. Not exactly what Jesus said. Not really. Taking up your cross and denying yourself is a pretty straightforward statement. How many do you know will deny themselves today? How many do you know will go with you not one mile, but 10, 20, 30, 40? Oh, well, my pastor, you know, he tells me he'll go with me. You know, really? What if you sin? Will he follow you in that sin? Or will he wait for you while you sin and then still pick you back up? Or do you have to do something first? You know, repent and do all these other things. Will he love you to the uttermost? Will he die for you? Will he lay down his life, his wife, his job, his ministry, his kids? Jesus did. Jesus did. So you see, last call isn't about following man. Last call isn't following about teachings of man. Last call isn't following, you know, the feeling, because there are a lot of people that really what they're following is feelings. I mean, the presence, I gotta have the presence. Oh, I saw the fire, I gotta have the fire, the flame is burning in me. What about when it's not? What about when it's not feeling? Right. Ooh, that, you know, it's not my flesh, it's Satan, you know. Got to rebuke that sucker, you know. I declare in the name of God that I got this, that, and the other thing. Did you ask Jesus? Did you ask God? 
I already know that most of these prophets that are running around are false. Most of these apostles really, you know, they're following traditions of man and calling themselves apostles. You know, but even if we took theologically just the Bible the way it's written, it says test them to see if they are apostles. Test them to see if they are prophets. I mean, when it comes to teachers, I'm a preacher, man, because I already tested everybody I've ever met when it came to Calvary Chapel. I didn't meet too many teachers. One or two, you know, actually had, you know, some questions for me that I was able to respond to and respond back. And we had interrogatories or we had uh, ability to talk to each other and communicate. We interlocuted. We had a dynamic relationship developing. Now, them I would call a pastor. Now, I don't call anybody standing in front of a pulpit preaching a pastor. Sorry, I don't. You can call, you know, like, oh, I don't know. They call him the pastor of governments because he's got the gift of governments and he's handling the administration, you know, of the church. So he's passing out the money, the money, you know, the Christmas cards and all the other stuff. It's not a pastor. That's a servant. Servant of, servant with the gift of administration. It's not a pastor. Sorry. Pastor is more like, you know, someone who, you know, knows what sheep are and knows how to birth them, how to raise them, how to lead them, and how to talk to them how to feed them, and how to really take care of them. Because Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I'd like to see a pastor who lays down his life for one of his sheep. I don't see too many of them. I met one or two, and they blew my mind, because God wouldn't let me get away with just you know, slam dunking everybody that I could meet. Oh, no. I mean, there's some that just humbled me to the extreme. Because I've given up so many things in order to follow Jesus. And I constantly do, regularly. Sometimes he takes them away. Sometimes I give them away. I mean, when I give them up easily, it's pretty simple. When he takes them away, I cringe. Ow! Really, Lord? You think I was hanging on too tight to that? I mean, I don't know if that's why he took it away. I don't ask anymore. I just figure, hey, God, fine, whatever. <laughs> it's your, I'm yours. Whatever you're going to do is fine with me. Whatever's the enemy, then you take care of him too. You know, I mean, I don't have to go out and slash and dash and pick targets. You know, he does fine taking care of me. And that's probably what you need to learn about last call. You will be taken care of. You will change. You will hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you. You will hear the Spirit of God convicting you. You will hear and know things that you won't agree with. As a matter of fact, I would recommend to you, don't watch, don't read, don't follow up, and don't do last call. But I will tell you, it's your last call. You're not going to get another. I will notify you right now. There are no ministries out there that are really a amalgam of composite quality teachings that is going to present to you with purity the things that are going to develop your relationship personally with Jesus. There's a lot of sites out there that are conglomerates, but they're that's as much wacky teaching as they do good teaching. Kind of like watching, you know, Christian television. I mean, you know, TBN isn't what it used to be, but it's still TBN, you know, and I, I, I got news for you. You know, Greg may be on there, you know, and may get some good teaching all that, but there's a lot of other people on there. I tell you, don't watch. You're going to get the wrong teaching, wrong idea, wrong impression. You'll be misled. And the fact is, it's not necessarily that bad being misled, as long as you're really seeking the Lord. But if you're not seeking the Lord and you think you have to stay because you aren't listening to the Lord, you may find yourself, like I told you and warned you, this is the last call before the rapture, you may find yourself not raptured, not taken, but left behind. Now, I know for a lot of you, you don't mind. You know, some of you are actually born again, spiritual filled Christians. You know, you don't mind being left behind any more than you mind being taken away. I'm kind of one of those people. It's like, well, you know, personally, I know too well what's going to happen. And I don't think I can handle the three and a half years of peace. Christians are driving me crazy. I mean, most of them are going to be deceived constantly, regularly. And even the spirit of a, a spirit that God sends is going to deceive people, I'm thinking. Do I really want to be around for something like that? I don't think so. So, what I'm trying to tell you is now, as we bring last call to the forefront, 
now and every time you wake up in the morning it's now which is your eternal now because you should be living in eternity you should already be living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God not from the mouth of man don't get me wrong there are times where preachers are anointed like me I mean I can you know stand up in a pulpit and shoo, you know God takes over and bingo you get what God said there are other times where you know some pastors are pre-programmed and you know they got it redound you know Chuck Smith said something that was very fascinating he said you know I used to preach you know I went to all these different churches that I really apologized to them because I had about 30 or 40 you know sermons all memorized and down pat you know and then once I was done I had to move on to another church it's hard for me to conceive Chuck Smith saying that but I believe it you know I mean he said it I remember and I get it but he was teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and he's teaching about being yielded to the Spirit of God and teaching about how God was training him, though he thought he was ready, he was a far cry from being a proper minister to what would become the ministry of Calvary Chapel. And, you know, I remember at the time, you know, he wasn't all that thrilled about hippies, you know, except for his wife seemed to be all you know, kind of like moving in the spirit. And so he was kind of catching up to where she was coming from. And, man, you could see how, you know, if Chuck was ticked, Chuck could be ticked. <laughs> But learning as he was, he recognized grace, and so he went after it, and he became a minister of grace. When we go forward with this last call, and we are, you know, we're, we're gearing up every day more and more so that the probable official day would probably be after the first of the year, the Gentile version, you know, the January first of the year. Um, I took a look around and I said, you know, I started reading, you know, a lot of devotionals. I started reading even some of the ones, like some of the ministry that I gave away. And I'm going to, you know, be straight up with Michael. You know. Hey, Michael, God bless you, you know. But you've really let slide daily devotions. You know, I mean, at one time, it was a massive ministry. And I supported you and I've encouraged you and I'm proud of you. And I know you're poor. So am I. And I know that you have a hard time ministering through a phone. So do I. But if you don't have something quality to give to Jesus, why give him anything at all? If it's not the best, like the little drummer boy said, hey, I want to play my drum for him. If you're not going to give out the quality, then I suggest that you sit down and have a long talk with Jesus. Because if it's not quite up to snuff, and you know it's not, or you know it is, then don't do it. Because you become a laughingstock rather than a minister of God. And that's the truth, even as I did. And I failed miserably with daily devotions several times when I would, I'm done, and walk away. Didn't last much over a week, you know. I felt so weak, so ill, so like something was missing that I couldn't help but go back to daily devotions and posting and then I realized and recognized that it wasn't about just posting material, but it was about reading and believing what I'm doing. Knowing that God sent me to daily devotions to make sure that someone's life was touched. To make sure that they got the best picture, the best image, the accurate rendition of Jesus as could be possible with those things that were being posted by me in my name associated with it to even put Jesus name on it so bro I got news for you man some of your posts on daily devotion are sucking me in I mean you've done better in the past if you ain't getting better you're getting worse just saying now I can say that to Michael and I know that he's gonna creak <laughs> but I love him so I tell him the truth I tell them exactly where the rubber meets the road. And if God can't use you, Michael, God will use someone else. Now, Michael does the devotionals, daily devotions, four in the morning. Um, he does them as best he can with what he's got. People should support him. He should take money in for it. He should do what he needs to do, whatever it may be. I can't. I never have, never will, never shall. But he has watched the ministry that I've done over the years, and he wanted to be a part of it. So he, he has the ministry. Whether it succeeds or whether it fails, daily devotions is his ministry. It's his 
offering unto God what's pleasing and acceptable in his sight or offering unto God and it being rejected. I know where daily devotion is today. It's just a piece of work that's out there that's just a bunch of writing that people aren't reading. I mean, some of them are. Some are faithful to just hang on for dear life. But you know, one of the things we said about last call is that we'll never put a post out there that's got a picture on it. And we never did that in daily devotion. We always made darn well sure, and I rejected anything on Facebook or anywhere else that didn't post with a picture. Why? Well, because people read, but they don't connect the dots. People look at something, they still don't connect the dots. But when you can combine a picture worth a thousand words and then a thousand words under a picture, hey, you're really knocking down some things that they have seen, things that they have heard, if it's read out loud, things that they have examined with their own hands, which is Facebook, which is, you know, whatever they do on the computer. So they're getting nailed in three parts of their soul, body, and spirit. So really, they're getting ministered to. I got news for you, bro. You're leaving out a couple of the most important parts. What they see. It may be they're reading, but that's not a picture. A picture goes a lot farther than words. It really does. So, you know, if he sees this, he'll, you know, kind of maybe cry or, you know, repent or hate me. <laughs> or send me an instant message to go, what? <laughs> I'll go, ah, don't worry about it. You know, God will bust you. <laughs> or maybe he has already. But um, that's what God does. If your relationship with Jesus isn't challenging you, if your relationship isn't with Jesus isn't causing you to go through struggles, I mean, tough decisions that you make right ones and you make wrong ones, I don't know that you're following Jesus because the disciples were not 100% while Jesus was on earth and they were not 100% after Jesus left the earth. Paul is not 100% right all the time, nor is he 100% wrong. I mean, it's really hard to find where he's wrong once in a while. But there's a couple places in Scripture where he says, hey, this is my opinion. I mean, you better take that as an opinion, otherwise you're blowing it. Because it's just his own personal opinion, and he was trying to be specific about it. Kind of like I would say, my personal opinion is, uh, I'm trying to think of one that I do personal opinions on. <laughs> um, what is my personal opinion on something that I know is not necessarily scriptural, but a good idea? Uh, see what that thing. Probably warning about something. Yeah, some malicious virus trying to attack me. Figures right in the middle of the word. But um, Paul expressed personal opinions in the scriptures, and they're recorded as being personal opinions. So you should take that as his personal opinion. That's all. But my personal opinion is that let's see. Man, I'm having a hard time thinking of a personal. Opinion. I know I used to teach them, but I can't think of them now because people get off on personal opinions and they don't follow the Word of God. Um, I, want, I keep trying to say the church, but it doesn't come to mind. I mean, I know I don't like mega churches, but you know, it doesn't mean it's bad. You know, Rick does pretty good with mega churches, but you know, there's a lot of mega churches. And they don't cut the mustard. Sorry, you can think they do, but. Uh, not even going to get into the teaching about, you know, how you prune, but, um, I can't think of a personal opinion. That's interesting. Maybe I'm not supposed to teach on personal opinion right now. Maybe it comes later. But in last call, that's why we want to have those devotionals for you. If you want to know God in a personal, intimate way, then read the devotional. If you want to hear God speak audibly to you, read the devotional. He will, in time, his timing with you. I don't know if it, it may happen fast for some. Slow with others may not happen with some. I'm pretty positive because of the blessing at the bond last call that he will speak to you. And I don't mean just in reading and, you know, hearing it in your head or your heart, you know, in a still small voice. I'm talking about God will speak to you in no uncertain terms. Like, if you've ever watched Fiddler on the Roof, which I know maybe some of you never have, but I can tell you a little bit, you know, just so you will watch it. There's a couple of scenes that are really good. One of them is just Fiddler on the roof talking, it sounds like, to himself in the barn, pitching hay, which had been already, you know, kind of like stinking. Yeah, you get the picture. So he's saying, God, oh God, you say we're the chosen people, but if we're so chosen, could you choose someone else for a little while? Boy, boy, such a deal. If I were a rich man. 
Uh uh. Because we're already told by Jesus, you don't want to be a rich man. Trust me. No, no, no. But in a Jewish culture way, it's, you know, that's what everybody wanted to be because they're all poor. And Jewish poor religious organizations became rich like Chabad. And they really don't know what they're doing either now. You know what I mean? They don't know what to do. When they were poor, they, you know, were closer to God. Now they're kind of like, I mean, they're pushing Hanukkah, of all things. But the point about Tuvia talking to God is that that's what we should be doing all the time. And God does talk back. I know because he does for me. I'm like, you know, don't talk that much to my wife. Okay, maybe I talk too much to my wife. But anyways, I talk with my wife. But I also talk to God more than I talk to my wife. And he talks to me. He's always talking to me. I always keep thinking, man, does God ever shut up? Because I don't think so. I don't think that he sleeps either because I think God just is a jabberwocky. You know, he just, he's always talking. I mean, I think that's what keeps everything alive. Or maybe that's just heaven talking, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to God. Blessed is he who comes in hell. But anyway, you get the picture, I hope. If you're not, then you need to read your Bible more. So when we do last call in starting this, as we are with this, um, Last Call won't be like from Vidibo Church, per se, and it won't be a part of Vidibo Ministry, per se. It's God reaching out through Vidibo, Vidibo Church, Vidibo Ministry, Michael, Michael Neverez, everybody else, you know, to you, to try to get you to open your ears and open your heart to examine these things, to see if you're in the faith. Because that's what Last Call is all about. Are you in the faith and are you hearing Jesus speak? If you're not, you're not learning. You're not growing. You're not knowing Jesus. Jesus said, this is what eternal life is, that they should know me and know him who sent me. To know someone means you've got to be talking to them. You can tell me that you know your wife, but if you never talked to her or had intercourse, I'd question whether or not you even know her at all. Or you're just lying about being married. You put a ring on your finger and you acted like you were married. Because God knows, you know, unless you are talking to your wife and she's talking to you, you don't have a wife. I don't care how many kids you got. It's called intercourse. And I don't mean as far as bearing children. I mean intercourse is communication. That's what it first meant, was communicating with your mouth to each other. That's intercourse. It's the intersection of lives and the intersection of two people heading in a certain direction that cross over each other. They intercourse. We're not talking about to become one flesh. That's a whole different story. One flesh? Yes. One spirit? No. So you got to go there and figure that one out. Yeah, that's what God said. He didn't say there would become one spirit and one soul. He said one flesh. Two shall become one flesh. Get the picture about two souls. Because really, if you have Jesus in you and Jesus in her, you got three souls. Because there's the soul of man and the soul of God. God. Frankly, you know, by way of the Holy Spirit, makes us three in one parent, not two. Just a little freebie there about what's happening in last call. So I don't want to, you know, get too carried away, but I got to say, just like it was in the days of Bethlehem, just like it was in the days when the wise men, some wise men knew that there was a king coming, just like that is today. Today we're no different than Jews. Seriously, we're no different than Jews who knew something was going to happen. They knew it was about the right time with a lot of wise tales, mythology, and wrong doctrine, and dogma, and everything else. And the scribes and the Pharisees already knowing where he's going to be born, but, you know, not paying attention to it anyways, because they said, oh, well, we got other stuff to do. And a lot of religious leaders are that way. But knowing that Jesus is coming, last calls about Jesus is coming. You don't have any more time left. If you've got three years, I'll be shocked. Five years, and I'll be, like, dropped dead in amazement. But I can tell you that you probably need to be looking for Jesus within two years. Because starting in 2017 is the countdown. Seriously. you got no more time left to play around. Matter of fact, you look at the world now, you can already tell the Holy Spirit to look back. That's obvious. Oh, post-Christian era, as they call it. What makes it a post-Christian era? The lack of the Holy Spirit in the world? That's what makes it a post-Christian era. So, as the Holy Spirit pulls back from his influence in the world, that means that 
the tide goes in, tide comes out, that means that there's something, a vacuum behind it, there's something filling it in. And that's evil. That's Satan. That's deception. That's the world and its ways. So as we go forward, we need to recognize that you don't have time to raise your children, buy a new house, buy a new car, do all these other things. You need to get you on the right path. And I mean, it may cost you right now your ministry. It may cost you your church. It may cost you your job. But if that's what it takes to get you to hear Jesus, you better get to know Jesus. Because I don't want to scare the bejesus out of you, but you might wind up in hell thinking you're going to heaven. It's that serious. I can't imagine how anybody could believe in guns, and yet they do. So I don't know what to tell you except for I know the simplest way to get you on the right path. Every day, read last call. You know, once you figure out where they come from, do it on your own. You don't need to wait for somebody to post it. Do it. You'll see the links. You'll see the place. You'll know the name. You can Google it. You can follow up. You can pursue what works for you and what doesn't. Because if you don't pursue God, you'll be left behind. If you don't want God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and willing to give up everything for it, you'll never learn. I don't care what church you're part of. I don't care if you're sitting right next to Great Lori. Huh. A lot of people seem to like him. Like, oh, nice guy. You know, I mean, I, I, there's sometimes some teachings I get a little bit out of. I don't get a lot, but I get a little. You know, but that's about it. You know, I mean, Rich Chapin, I get something out of it every time. I mean, a big difference. But what is that difference? Just simply, the Holy Spirit doesn't want me to get anything out of Greg. I mean, I got what I needed from him, and that's all he could give me. That was the message of salvation. I got saved and went on from there to Calvary, <laughs> the source at the time. And so, you know, I learned there. You know, and man, talk about learning a lot in a short period of time. <laughs> Cram course. And then it took 40 years to figure it all out or let it come out. And that's what you have to do as you begin to realize you don't have it all. You're not there. You're sitting in a pew. When you should be doing unto others what's been done unto you. You should be teaching, preaching, reaching out to the unsaved. Not sitting in a pew, waiting and wondering what to do. Or being told, oh man, just love your wife, go to work, take care of the kids, you know, polish the car, buy a Harley, you know, just go to our fellowship, you know, and be happy. If that's your Christianity... Don't follow last call. Because these devotionals from these men of God and women of God will screw up your life because they want you to live 